Hey, how's it going everyone? My name is Amos and in today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you some stock market news that I think is pretty relevant and I will be giving my commentary and opinion after each article and then at the end of this video, I'll be sharing with you some stocks that are on my radar for one reason or another. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. The first one that I want to share with you is this, the world economy on track for slight pickup as inflation is tamed. So it looks like all of the pandemic-induced fear and doom about the global economy is now coming to a calm. And I still can't believe it, but it looks like Jerome Powell has pulled off the soft landing and avoided the recession altogether. The first paragraph right here says, falling interest rates and recovering real wages will help drive a slight pickup in global economic growth this year and next. Now, I know there's a lot of people that say, hey, the stock market and the economy is not correlated. But here's where I'm coming from. If the economy is doing well, which is the input of all the different economic drivers and everyone's different incomes, employment numbers, and overall production, then I feel like most S&P 500 publicly traded companies are also going to do okay. Now, here's the number that they are projecting. They're expecting the global output to increase by 3.2% for this year. So worst comes to worst, on average, the economic output for our society should be around 3%, which is around the rate of inflation. And as we scroll down right here, it says the US is largely responsible for that better performance. But India and Brazil are also growing more rapidly than expected, as is the UK. By contrast, Germany and Japan have disappointed. Global economists are are happy to see a number of 3.2%. But where I'm trying to come from is the S&P 500, the average uh, rate of return is 10% in a given year. Let's be pretty happy that the stock market's average return is not 3%. Thank goodness there is a separation and a distinction between the stock market and the economy. Because with the stock market, you get a better rate of return. I know, silly comparison, but it is worth pointing out. And um, on that note of Japan... I don't know if you know this or not, but I actually live here in Japan. And I got to say, during the rough moments of this pandemic and inflation, I started boycotting certain foods. Because once I started seeing the price of milk go up to like $10 for a gallon or Greek yogurt turn into $7.50 for a tub, I said, you know what? I'm just not going to have it. The good news is, I've noticed since the last month, the price of eggs, the price of dairy, the price of meat have all been slowly coming down, at least here in Japan, which you might not be experiencing that pattern because in this article, it says in the US, the gap between food price and wage inflation between the end of 2019 and the second quarter of this year was roughly four percentage points. In other words, the price of grocery food items still pretty high. But here in Japan, they are coming back down, and I'm pretty thankful for that. So 3.2% for the global output for this year. And uh, just for the U.S., I think it's around right here. For the U.S., 2.6%, which isn't the greatest number in the world. But hey, at least we're in the positive, and the GDP is growing, and our stock market is doing phenomenal right now. And if you're still sitting on the sidelines with your cash, Dude, I don't even know what to tell you. If this is you, you really got to look into the whole idea of time in the market versus timing the market. Sitting on the sidelines with your cash, I don't know, man. That opportunity cost is going to bite you right in the left nipple. Moving on to the next article. Starbucks new CEO targets hectic stores, overwhelming menus. Brian Nickel, which is the new CEO, says chain must improve filling orders on time, make its cafes more welcoming. The CEO said that improving the company's U.S. store operations is his first priority, saying cafes need to be more welcoming and avoid being overwhelmed with the to-go orders. Wall Street, company leaders, and customers have high expectations for Nickel to improve operations at Starbucks. On the other hand, Starbucks board, investors, and long-term leader Howard Schultz have praised Nickel, the former CEO of Chipotle Mexican Grill. That's the smile of a guy that is making millions of dollars a year as the CEO of Starbucks. Even before he was announced for the takeover of the CEO position, I was dollar cost averaging into Starbucks, coming from a guy who does not drink coffee, meaning I don't even go to Starbucks. 
But knowing its iconic brand, knowing how much of an influence it has on Americans and across the world, and I saw the unjustified sell-off happening, I had to buy into it, right? Once I looked at their finances, their numbers and their data and looked into the intangibles, I just thought that the sell-off for Starbucks, absolutely temporary. Once this guy was announced as the new CEO, the stock price for Starbucks just skyrocketed overnight, and now it's been trading flat until Wall Street sees some changes being implemented. And even when Wall Street disagreed with me and Starbucks was just going on a decline, I was still pretty excited about the company, especially on a horizon of five to 10 years. Now that the Chipotle CEO is the Starbucks CEO, I'm absolutely bullish on this company. The one thing that I really made me hesitate, gave me a red flag, was when I tuned in to the Starbucks annual investors you know, meeting, when the analysts asked the current CEO and the leadership about, hey, what's the game plan right now? The metrics are declining. Why are you guys going so gung-ho about China? The leadership team of Starbucks about eight months ago did not have an answer. They were just like, hey, we're going for China. It's going to happen. It's going to work out. Uh, our game plan, we're not really sure. When I heard that, it gave me hesitation. Internationally, Nichols said he intends to learn about the companies more than 80 global markets, including China, because there's some analysts and investors that want China to operate in a decentralized command type of operation flow. And instead of putting all their eggs in one basket and Nichols saying, yes, we're committed to the idea of going 110 miles per hour in China and opening up new Starbucks left and right. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, we need to understand the path to growing in China's dynamic market. While he still sees the potential for expanding in regions such as the Middle East, when we think about Turkey, Asia, Europe, and Latin America. This is such a breath of fresh air. Because the past leadership, dude, that guy was clueless. He was just gung-ho about China while knowing that China is going through a rough economic time right now and was adamant around the idea of putting all their eggs into the Chinese basket of saying, hey, that's our growth driver going forward. Instead of saying that, Nickel is saying, yo, we need to go back to the drawing board and see what's our best path going forward. That's why a CEO gets the big bucks because their vision and their transformation that they lay out for the middle managers and for the stores and for the franchisees is crucial for turning around the story of a company or a business. And that's why I'm still not selling out of my Starbucks investment. Even though I'm up by like 25% or something like that, maybe it's 30% by this point, I'm still not selling out. Because I think Starbucks still has a lot more room to go. And I think based on my last um, intrinsic valuation calculations, I think my price target for Starbucks was around 110 or 120. And as of right now, I think they're trading at around like $96, $97 a share. So plenty of room to go. And then uh, once they do hit that 120 number, I'll probably reevaluate to sell or not based on their uh, numbers and their earnings reports and by listening to uh, what their future looks like. And then next up, we have this article right here. Google paid $2.7 billion to bring back an AI genius who quit in frustration. Amid debate on whether tech companies are overspending on AI, Google's pricey reunion with Noam uh, Sazir draws attention. So I made a uh, stock analysis video of Google about a week or two ago, and I talked about one of my hesitations with this company, and it's that when Google was young, they were able to operate with this nimble startup mentality, right? Just expanding and thinking with a revolutionary perspective. However, Google is now one of the biggest companies around the world with over like 179,000 employees. And I was saying, based on what I know about the company from my friends that work there as middle managers and as directors, there's a lot of red tape that exists in this company. As a result, a lot of people that are working on you know, groundbreaking projects, they get frustrated and they leave. They leave to actually launch their own company because Google has so much red tape that it's hard and difficult a challenge to be innovative. So if you are an engineer or a product manager and you know that what you have on your table right now is going to change the way the world is going to operate and then for your own company to put a leash on you and to handicap you, of course you're going to leave. Of course you're going to jump ship. 
And that's exactly what happened here. Shazir quit Google in 2021 to start his own company after the search giant refused to release a chatbot he developed. Basically, he created something called a character AI that operates almost identically to chat GPT. You give it a prompt, you give it a question, you give it a uh, search query, and it gives you a response based on AI, based on what you want to hear, see, or what you're looking for. Google shut down that project because they were like, uh, we don't know about this. Google, the company, pushed back because they were worried about the safety concerns of monopolistic practices of Google telling people what they want. Instead of being able to see like the top 10 results and picking for yourself, I guess Google was scared about that. However, now they're backpedaling because they're saying, hey, it's a remarkable turn of events after Shazir publicly said the search giant had become too risk averse in developing AI. The 48-year-old engineer is now back into the company. Not only did they pay $2.7 billion for that intellectual property of what he created, but there was also a stipulation that he had to come back into the company right here. Shazir agreed to work for Google again. And now he has to be subject to the red tape again. I don't know about you, but it, it kind of puts a bad taste in my mouth and it reminds Reminds me of the footprint of what led to Intel falling from their throne. Intel at one point used to be the innovative giants in Silicon Valley with their chips. And then they got to a point where they just wanted to play it safe. They were turning down projects and frustrated engineers were jumping shift left and right for AMD or for other companies. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm seeing the same pattern play out with Google. Maybe Google has gotten too big for their own good, to the point where innovation is now being squished because I get it. From an executive's perspective, the tried and true steady source of income is always better than pushing the boundary and then getting litigation risks. Like I get their point of view, but a company will start to decline unless you stay revolutionary. And so as much as I hate Amazon, I don't invest in Amazon because I really don't like the way they treat their workers, but that's for another video in itself. I have to give them props to where props are due. Amazon is always continuously, they even preach this. This is one of their company mottos. They say day one, every single day is day one, your first day on the job. You always need to look at things with a fresh perspective to see how you can make it better, to do continuous improvement. Their company DNA of jumping out of the comfort zone, I think that's what's leading to Amazon's success. Might be an unpopular opinion, but playing it safe, especially in this AI technology-driven uh, generation, is not the way to go. And I say that because I'm old enough to remember Kodak. At one point, they were considered one of the technology giants of the world, but they did not stay innovative, right? Their uh, technology with what, the print camera, once that became outdated, their entire business model just came crumbling down. So time and time again, it just shows you if you are going to survive and thrive in the tech industry, you need to be innovative. You can't just play it safe. And I'll end my commentary on Google with this. With this guy, Noam, I bet they were paying him at around like what, $350,000 with some RSUs, total compensation sitting at around like $550,000 a year. In simplicity's sakes, they were paying this guy about half a million dollars a year as an engineer. But because they did not allow him the liberty to explore and execute on his project of character AI, he jumped ship and now they had to pay $2.7 billion for their mistake of playing it too safe and then realizing like, okay, actually, this AI thing is a really good idea. We need him back. We need his ideas, the intellectual property. And they had to waste $2.7 billion. It's like, dude, I think Google does a really good job of recruiting some of the most intelligent people around the world to create these innovative projects. But Google's corporate culture is going to lead to their downfall. I'm just saying that. I'm calling it right now. If Google does not change their DNA and their corporate policies of pushing the boundaries of being revolutionary, Revolutionary again, this company is going to collapse. I'm saying it right now. Which leads me to the last Wall Street news that I want to talk about, which is this one. Uh, don't count on a mega deal to save Intel. So there's been a lot of speculation and talk about Qualcomm, which is another chips uh, manufacturer that has a lot of intellectual property for hardware that are inside of our Samsung and iPhone devices. And they're thinking about merging and buying out Intel. Intel has never been this cheap. 
that doesn't make the story chip maker a great deal. Once the world's most dominant designer and producer of advanced semiconductors, Intel's stock price has collapsed this year as its problems have mounted. The company's disastrous second quarter report in early August put its market cap below $100 billion for the first time since 2012. It also pushed the stock below the company's book value, largely consisting of factories and intellectual property minus its net borrowings. So here's where I'm coming from. I think Intel, a company that used to be so good, so awesome with their chips, has now turned into a company that is panicking. Nobody wants to use their chips because they realize at the same price point, you could just get an AMD that does double of what Intel does at a fraction of the cost. So Intel is scrambling. What is their identity? If they're not going to be able to design and engineer game-breaking technology chips, they're thinking about becoming the factory that makes those chips, much like uh, TSM. But I think people are not thinking straight. The reason why TSM is going to win these uh, chip contract deals is the manufacturing process for Taiwan and in China is going to be so much cheaper than it is to make those exact same chips in-house in the U.S. Even when there's like a $5 billion grant coming from the U.S., just think about the SG&A. Right, the payroll for Americans to make those chips in that factory, the idea of having good margins and Intel being profitable, I just, I just don't see it. I don't. As a guy who used to work in operations, like that's my background, retail operations and supply chain. When I think about it from a margin perspective of Americans making it, I just don't see the future for Intel. Unless there's going to be a lot of robotics involved and you take away the human capital aspect, Yes, maybe Intel can be okay. And maybe that's the vision that Qualcomm has for Intel. Take over the company because they're getting like a four, five, six billion dollar contract from the US government to jumpstart their foundry business and take that over and then utilize robotics in order to be profitable and robust and to be best in class in chips manufacturing. Not engineering, but manufacturing. Maybe that's the vision that they have, but I just, I'm, I'm not buying into it. I'm not. I'll let the article do the talking right here. Pat Gelsinger came back aboard the company as CEO and began uh, leading an ambitious turnaround plan to regain the company's lead in manufacturing technology while also building a foundry business to produce chips designed by other firms. So they could potentially be manufacturing the M-series chips for Apple or even their A-series for their iPhones and Tensor chips for Google Pixels. Like that's the vision that they have. However, check this out. It has been an expensive undertaking. Intel's foundry operation lost $5 billion in the first six months of this year, while 99% of its revenue is coming from Intel's own internal needs. This pivot to manufacture all these chips caused the company to lose over $12.6 billion of cash in the past 12 months. And Wall Street expects this annual cash burn to continue. And because Intel is losing so much cash, they literally had to cut and get rid of their dividend. And so when a company gets rid of their dividend, you always know that's a red flag. But a company that is burning through $12 billion of cash, man. I just, I'm not invested into AMD or TSM, but I'm just repulsed, disgusted by Intel. Like, this is a company that would offend me as a potential investor. I don't know what they're doing. Like, I understand their turnaround game story and the plan that they have, but it's just like, oh, I don't know. I I don't like it. This is a company for the past two decades has played it so safe, they literally don't know how to be innovative anymore. All that to say, I would never invest into Intel. And I'll end it with this. With an optimistic hat on, I can see them having a CAGR, you know, annual compound growth rate of about like six to nine percent a year, broken down from 20 years. So kind of modest returns, but not the best, especially when you compare it to their peers. On the other end of the spectrum, if I think about it in a realistic lens, I just feel like this company might go bankrupt in the next five to 10 years. If they continue to keep burning through this cash, trying to manufacture chips that they're not even experts in because this is a pivot, if they keep burning through cash year after year, they're going to run themselves out of business. Because think about it. If you're Apple, if you're Google, 
if you're Amazon, do you truly want your chips to be manufactured by Intel, who's new to the game, they're rookies, they're noobs? Or would you just trust the tried and true, the ones who are able to make your chips at a fraction of the price, TSM? From a business perspective, unless the government gives subsidies or helps out Google or Apple for doing a deal with Intel, Intel is going to lose. I feel like I've said too much. Let's go ahead and move on to the next article, which is a fun one. Did you know this past week, Mozart, which is one of the greatest composers of all time, he actually dropped a new piece. Check this article out from the Smithsonian. This lost Mozart composition hasn't been heard for centuries. Now you can listen to it. More than 250 years after a teenage Mozart wrote Serenade in C, a copy of the piece has surfaced in the collections of a German library. Now all over social media, uh, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, people are playing it out and I gotta tell you, it's a bop. And I say that as a guy who these days, I've been really getting into jazz and classical music. And so to hear a piece drop 250 years later unintentionally, like he never meant for this to be published because I'm sure he wanted to make, you know, revisions and modifications. But as is, it's quite the piece. I'm telling you, it's it's a banger. But anyways, the composition was hidden in the holdings of Germany's Lisbig Municipal Libraries, some 280 miles north of Salzburg, Austria. Speaking of which, when I was in the army, I was stationed in uh, Germany. I lived in an area called Bavaria. I actually went to a Bach concert, right? Because I was near Ansbach. And one of my favorite things to do as a young 20-something year old at the time was to actually go to these classical music concerts. Because not only was it affordable, but it felt like it was readily available. Whereas here in Japan, there's barely any classical concerts ever happening. But then again, that's because classical music is not really the thing here. But if you need a music uh, song recommendation, give this one a try. Serenade in C by Mozart. And then as promised, there's two stocks that I'm looking at right now. Like I'm literally about to pull the trigger because the stock price is getting too good to be true. Number one is going to be Humana. I actually did a deep dive in a stock analysis video for this company. And unfortunately, after I published that video, it just kept shooting up in valuation. I just wasn't able to buy in. However, let's uh, let's pull this out. So year to date, they're down by negative 33%. I made that video at around this time right here, around April 29th, April 30th. And then since then, it went up to like right here, uh, 30%. And then since then, it's been dropping. Why? Because I think with the presidential election, what? a month and a half away, there's a lot of uncertainty and headwinds coming their way, depending on who's going to be in charge of the Oval Office. For me, I see that as a buying opportunity. I know how high quality of a company Humana is. And so strangely enough, when you look at all of their peers like CVS and uh, United Healthcare and some other health insurance related companies, they're also dropping in valuation, which I think I could be wrong because I'm stupid sometimes. I think it's temporary. After the election, I feel like all of these companies are going to shoot right back up to where they are and trading at multiples of like 40, 45. To be trading at a 22 PE ratio while knowing that they're posting double digit growth numbers, I think it's absolutely undervalued. And um, if it hits around 305, 301, I'm most likely going to buy in. The next company that I want to talk about is Visa. So recent news came out that they are going to start investigating Visa for their uh, monopolistic practices of how it seems like almost every debit card is branded and um, serviced through Visa. What I'm trying to say is Visa has had their business model going on for the past like six, seven decades. Why now? Why are they probing this company now? And so when we look at what's going on, this company just took a nosedive. When that was announced, they went from 288 a share down to 269, and it's a drop of about 6.5%. Visa is one of those very high quality dividend compounders with cheese, very rarely goes on a dip. And so for me, I know this company is going to sail through those uh, monopolistic allegations by paying like a slap on the wrist fee. They're going to continue doing business as usual. I'm not a wizard. I'm not Harry Potter. I can't predict the future. 
I think right now, I think there's an overreaction happening on Wall Street and uh, Visa is going through the sell-off. So I'm not sure when the bottom is going to be exactly, but once it kind of like flattens out and starts trading sideways, I'll probably pick up a few shares here and there because Visa is so high quality. Visa reminds me of like Costco. Right To buy Costco on the dip, you've got to be really lucky. And so for me to see a dip of this proportion happening with Visa, yes. So Visa and Humana are the two companies that I'm looking to buy this week and the next. Anyways, I don't know. Let me know what you think about this uh, style of video and this format, this modality of talking about you know Wall Street news, my commentary, and then some stocks that I'm looking at. Anyways, thanks for watching my video. I don't even know you, but uh, you feel like a friend to me. So uh, stay safe, and I'll talk to you really soon, man.